Well, listen, so far so good. Um, th- we're really learning a lot. I was actually sort of just reviewing as I was eating my lunch today. I had a lovely lunch of Indian food. That's my favorite food in the world. Now, does that get me like a thumbs up with anybody? I got like my Indian contingency over here. Yeah, there we go. My favorite food in the world. I like, all, I, I rarely meet food that I don't like, believe it or not. Um, but uh, Indian food is just my favorite. The, the, the collection of textures and flavors, and it's just like, it's just perfect for me. Now, I like other kinds of food. There's a lot of like foods that are tied for second, right? But the top, the award for me goes to Indian food. So anyway, <laughs> Stella's clapping. She's like, that's right, that's right. Um, now, having said that, so I'm feeling really good. I'm feeling really fired up. My energy level, I could preach 10, 10 sermons easy in a row. The only thing that we're going to have to figure out is can my voice hang in there? But I think it will. I think we'll be all right. Um, as I was sort of rehearsing in my mind over lunch about what we'd covered, we've really covered a lot of material, and there's been a consistent theme that's been emerging all the way. And that is our table of what? You remind me. Our table of truth, and then we're building... We're putting things on there, and the very first thing that we put on there that is both normative and non-negotiable is what? What does this water bottle represent? Very good. God is love, and it's very appropriate because uh, it's water to the thirsty. For those who are learning, and even for those of us who know, as we continue to learn just how good God is, it slakes the thirst. It's a thing of absolute beauty to know that the universe is a friendly universe and that that God himself as the creator is looking out for us. Now, in addition to that sort of picture of the table of truth and the, the, the central figure that we began with, that God is love, we've learned quite a lot. We started with the question, what is the Bible? And we spent time on that, important time. Then we said, who is God? And that's where we got our God is love piece from. Then we said, does God exist? And uh, we saw that there are many good external and internal reasons for believing that God exists. We've spent time on uh, why is there suffering? Uh, why do innocent children suffer? Then we talked about will there ever be justice on earth? Who killed Jesus, etc. And I might have missed one in there. But we're really off to a, a very good start. And at this point, I want to address something that will really highlight the supreme and, and amazing relationality of the God of Scripture. And uh, what we're going to talk about here, frankly, is so mind-blowing that even though I have presented uh, presentations about this and like this in many different situations, venues, and settings, it never, ever ceases to amaze me, the truth that we're going to talk about here today. And uh, so what I want to do is uh, just begin by uh, sort of reminding ourselves of, of how Scripture opens. It opens with, of course, creation. We've spent time on that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And uh, as God is creating in Genesis 1, let's just go there together just to sort of remind ourselves of these passages. As God is creating in Genesis chapter 1, the means or the vehicle by which he is creating is his word. We spoke, uh, I think, two sessions ago or, th- or three sessions ago. We talked about that phrase that comes up in Genesis 1 over and over again. And the phrase is, and it was good. And it is, was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. Um, but another phrase that's very consistent in Genesis chapter 1 is this phrase, then God said. Then God said. So take, for example, verse 3. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 4, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light, the light from the darkness. Verse 6, then God said, let there be a firmament. Verse 9, then God said, let the waters uh, under the heavens be gathered together into one place. Verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass. This is another phrase that comes up again and again and again in Moses' creation account here in Genesis. Then God said. And so the means by which, the vehicle through which God is creating is his word, right? He just speaks and the thing comes into existence. Now the, the uh, sort of philosophical, theological term for this is ex nihilo, which uh, is just the Latin for out of nothing. It's not as though God had, you know, resources, raw materials from which he had to gather what he needed and then sort of construct. No, 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 no. He's just speaking. Let there be light. There's light. And let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. There's the waters above from the waters below. Let there be, let there be, let there be. And God said, and God said, and God said. So God is creating by his word. By his what, everyone? By his word. One of my favorite authors has this great line where she says that the creative energy that brought the worlds into existence is contained in the word of God. 
And what a great line. I mean, the creative energy that brought worlds into existence is contained in the Word of God. Genesis 1 and 2 both tell the same story, but they tell the same story from slightly different perspectives. And scholars have noted this um, uh, in in many commentaries and and, uh, in many uh, volumes on Genesis. Now, the skeptics have suggested that there's, there's two different creation accounts, that there's the Genesis 1 account and the Genesis 2 account, as if they're somehow unharmonious or, or internally contradictory, which is certainly not the case. What you do have, though, is a slight difference of perspective or even a difference of emphasis. A difference of, what was that second word I said there? Emphasis. In Genesis chapter 1, you find God creating, for lack of a better term, the sort of physical realities uh, of which the world is made of. He makes the light and he makes the earth and the dry ground and, and he, he makes the space or the firmament between the waters above and the waters below and he, he makes the animals and you see God sort of speaking the physical material world into existence and again he's doing it by means of his voice, of his word he, he says let there be light there is light, let there be a firmament there's a firmament, let there be a greater light to rule the day, there's the sun and a lesser light the night and there's the moon so God is in Genesis chapter 1, I wouldn't say distant. That would, be, that would not be exactly right. But it's as if God is sort of here. And I know they're going to hate me for going out of the lighting here, but it'll actually serve my purpose. Um, it's as if God is sort of here, as it were, somewhat in the shadows, speaking the thing into existence. And so let there be... Sh- and, and things are sort of coming into being and into existence by virtue of God's word. Now that is contrasted with what happens in Genesis 2. In Genesis chapter 2, a very interesting thing happens. It's as if, to go back to my lighting metaphor here, thanks guys in the control room for letting me do this. Of course, I would do it even if they didn't let me. Um, God is, as it were, stepping out of the shadows, stepping off of the veranda of the universe, and he actually comes down to earth itself. Now, we know this because of the language that Moses uses. Now, check this out, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and look at this. It says, uh, we'll pick it up in verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Our presentation here is titled, Does God, Do You Have Time for Me? Does God Have Time for Me? And we're going to see that, that God is longing to spend time with us. In fact, he is so thoroughly relational in his nature and in his character. That's the very thing he wants most is to spend time with you and with all of his creation. And so here in Genesis chapter 2, very interesting, where, where God over here is speaking, let there be light, let there be a firmament, let there be a greater light, let there be the dry land, let there be the seas. In Genesis 2, God, as it were, steps out, and the Bible says that he formed and fashioned man from the dust of the earth. Now, that's the language of 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 a sculptor. That's the language of hands and knees and feet and a body that's forming and fashioning and shaping. Now, don't miss the significance of that just just on on the face of it. Rather Rather than speaking Adam into existence, which let me just ask this question, could God have done that? Well, certainly with the resources of omnipotence at his disposal, he could have just said, and let there be an Adam. Right? And Adam could have been created. And let there be an Eve. And Eve could have been created. So, so why does God create in this way? Not out of necessity, but out of intentionality. Why does he come, listen to the word here, close to his creation? You see, it's one thing to speak a sun into existence and to speak a moon into existence and to speak a firmament into existence. But, but mankind, there's something significant here. There's something relational here. Adam cannot be merely spoken into existence. Adam is formed and he is fashioned and he is created and then he is before God. Now, this is where things get really interesting. God could have now just said, come alive, or he could have just thought, you know, come alive, and Adam would have snapped to life. But but it says that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, I just want that to sort of sink in here. He breathed into his nostrils. There are only three people on planet Earth that I am willing to get close enough with that I could theoretically breathe into their nostrils. Okay, and that's my oldest son, my youngest son, and my wife. And of those three, I prefer to breathe into my wife's nostrils as a general rule. Um, Now, 
The point is basically this. We've all met that person who does not have a good sense of personal space. Yeah? That person might be you. And you might be thinking, oh, I've never met anybody who has any sense. <laughs> no, We've all met that person. And just, just here for, for our purposes, the appropriate distance between you and another human being, if you're talking to them sort of one-on-one -on -one or in a small group, is an arm's length. Okay? Just let everybody let that sink in. This is the appropriate distance, okay? As soon as you come inside of arm's length, like you're in their, you know, that's their space. And you, it's a no-fly zone to get in there unless you're married or they're your kids or something, right? And so as a general rule, when you're talking to somebody, you sort of stand at arm's length. It would be unusual to stand further than that, right? Like you wouldn't just strike up a conversation with somebody on the other side of the room. So, how you been? No, no need to come closer. We'll just yell at one another. No. As a general rule, when you're talking to somebody, you want to get close, but not too close. You, you picking up what I'm, what I'm, what I'm throwing here? You, you, you smelling what I'm cooking? Okay. <laughs> I had a friend who used to say, oh yeah, David, I'm smelling what you're cooking, but I'm not tasting what you're chewing. That's what he'd say. <laughs> you don't want to get that close. You don't want to get so close that you're tasting what they're chewing, so to speak. Um, so now here in this particular situation, it's fascinating because, because proximity or closeness necessarily communicates intimacy, right? The, the closer that you come to another person, there's an intimacy there that can get a little awkward if you just like met this guy and he's right up in your grill. You're like, hey, I really like you. And you're just like, whoa, you know, like, hey, I like you too, but can we not like each other so much? <laughs> now, the point here is that when, when it says that God breathed into Adam's nostrils, that communicates intimacy. Right? There would have been a, many other ways that God could have brought Adam to life. But the Bible says, and I like to use my sanctified imagination here, as he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that God, as it were, sort of took Adam by the cheeks and, and he just leaned in and he just... And Adam, who was formerly a sculpture, just a pile of dirt, comes to life. And if this picture is correct, let me ask you the question. What would be the first thing that Adam would see? What would be the thing that he would see as he opens his eyes for the first time? Yeah, he'd see the face of God, right? The uninterrupted, unimposed, unimpeded face of God. And then I can imagine God kind of just leaning back and saying, Welcome, my son, to life. And the Bible actually calls Adam the son of God. The two primary figures in the Old Testament that are referred to as the son of God are Israel and Adam. Both are called the son of God, which is why it's so significant when Jesus shows up in the New Testament and is repeatedly referred to both by others and by himself as the son of God. He's also, refer he refers to himself, in fact, his favorite title for himself was the son of man. And so here we see this relationality. Jesus is the new Adam. Jesus is the new Israel. And when God brought the, the first Adam into existence, he did so in a relationally significant and pregnant way. That's the point. He could have just stood over here, just as he did with the sun, the moon, the stars, and other things, and said, okay, let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be, almost in a kind of sense of aloofness or detachment, I believe that God purposefully has Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 to show this very point. That when it comes time to make a companion, when it comes time to make a son, in fact, let's take this one step further, and it's where we're going in this whole presentation. When it comes time to make a friend, you have to come close. You have to come close to fashion, to form, and then he breathes and Adam comes to life. In interestingly, God keeps the same intimacy motif when he makes Eve because he, he fashions and forms Eve. It's actually a very different word. The Hebrew word is he built Eve, right? He, he formed Adam, but he built Eve. Both require the hands. Both require skill. Both require craftsmanship. And notice where Eve is built from. She's built from a, a rib in Adam's side. The whole thing is thoroughly relational. Do, do you pick that up? Eve is connected to God because God is the one who makes her and fashions her. And Adam and Eve are connected with one another because they literally come from the same raw materials. I mean, the whole thing is just steeped in this beautiful, connective, relational language. So far, so good, everyone? Now, you could make a very strong case that the, the, the thorough relationality of, of Scripture, that, that actually Scripture just on the whole, can be boiled down to, to the single most significant word. I think you could make this case. And that case could 
quite possibly be, that word could quite possibly be with. With. And uh, let me sort of try and make that case for you here. Clearly, God is with Adam as he's forming and fashioning him here. But then when rebellion comes into the picture, when disobedience comes into the picture, which we've already spent a little bit of time talking about, that withness is, is lost. That, that proximity, that intimacy, that closeness is lost. And, and God, Adam basically goes his own way. Eve and the descendants of Adam and Eve go their own selfish way. But the hand of God was always extended, ever extended. In fact, just very quickly by way of illustration there, when it came time, uh, when Adam had sinned and, and guilt and shame and a sense of, of, of having failed, overcame he and Eve, and they fled from God, it wasn't they that went looking for God. Hey, we need help. God, where are you? Why have you abandoned us? You're too ashamed to be around us. No, it was God that went looking for Adam. Adam, where are you? See, nothing changes with God, and don't miss that. When Adam had sinned and Eve had sinned, when they had rebelled, when they had transgressed, when they had disobeyed, when they had shown themselves disloyal, nothing changed with God. I, I just, I want that to sink in. God did the same thing he'd always done. The person or persons that had changed were Adam and Eve. They were the one who were now, the Bible says, hiding themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. There's an amazing verse in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. It says, is the, Lord, is the Lord's hand shortened that it cannot save? Is his ear heavy that he cannot hear? No. But your sins, listen carefully, have separated you from your God. And your iniquities have hid his face from you. Now, don't miss that. I'm just going to go out of the lighting here again, guys. You're going to have to forgive me. Here is a wall, a load-bearing wall, okay? If I stand against this wall and push with all of my power... I'm not Samson, so don't worry, the place is stable. Um, but if I stand here and I push, you will notice that a space is coming between the wall and I. Do you see that? Okay, but who's moving? Is the wall moving away from me? Am I, am I that strong that I'm pushing the wall away from me? What's happening? I am, I am pushing myself away from the wall. And that's exactly what Isaiah 59 says. It says, your sins have separated you from your God. Right? It doesn't say your sins have pushed God away from you. Your sins have pushed you away from God. Do you hear the difference? Yes or no? Right. In the garden, it, it wasn't as though God was so revolted, God was so repulsed, God was so disgusted and ashamed by Adam's sin that he's like, okay, I'm done with you. Find yourself, figure it out on your own. No. Nothing changes with God. God continues to go down in the garden for the purpose of fellowship, for the purpose of relationship. In fact, if you really examine the Genesis 1, 2, and 3 accounts carefully, the reason that God goes into the garden in Genesis 3 is to announce the good news. He comes in the garden to tell them a way of escape has been made and a deliverer will come. I mean, it's really awesome. He goes in to bring good news. But Adam and Eve are just sure that the guilt that they're feeling, that the, the uh, shame that they're feeling, and don't miss this, they're sure, they, they believe that it is actually a reflection of God's attitude toward them. Now, I've just got to spend a moment on that because this is not well understood. When God finally catches up to Adam and says, what's going on? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? Adam's response is, we heard your voice and we were afraid. Now, that raises the question, why afraid? Why afraid? God hasn't changed, but what has changed is their perception of God because now they think that the guilt that they're feeling, the shame that they're feeling because of their disloyalty and rebellion, they mistakenly assume. They mistakenly, what word did I say, everyone? They mistakenly assume that the guilt they're feeling is an accurate reflection of God's attitude toward them. But in fact, God's attitude toward them was just as consistent and loving and, and gracious as it had ever been. In fact, now more so because they're in need. They're really in need. And so they flee, not from the real God, they're fleeing from a caricature of God that they had created in their mind. And I tell you, the world is filled with people just like this. People who are fleeing, not from the true God, not from the real God, but fleeing from a caricature of God. And the good news is that God knows the difference. God knows when people are resisting, not the truth, but they're resisting a caricature, a, a picture, a cartoon of what he really is. And in some places, in some instances, a terrible, grotesque, and pitiable cartoon. No, 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 no. So when God finally locates Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, rather than issuing condemnation and, what were you thinking? How Have you lost your mind? He brings good news. 
He brings good news. Now, he doesn't in any way diminish the fact that, yeah, you know, I told you that in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. He didn't say, in the day that you eat thereof, I'll kill you. Do you hear the difference? It's a totally different animal. One is a statement of fact about what will happen, and the other is a statement about something I will do. In the day that thou eatest thereof, I will surely kill you. It's not what it says. It says, in the day that you eat thereof, you'll die. God now comes into the garden to announce that a way of escape has been made from that death. Do you feel this? And death becomes the ultimate thing that separates us from our loved ones and from God. That's the withness that's lost sight of. It's not only sin, it's the consequence of sin, which is death, that, that, that gets rid of that withness that God created us to experience. Adam was with Eve, Eve was with Adam, and they both were with God, and that withness is lost sight of because of rebellion, sin, shame, guilt, and disobedience. Well, an interesting thing happens. When God comes now through a variety of covenants that we're probably not going to have a lot of time to explore in this series, but God makes a series of covenants. He made a covenant with Adam. He makes a covenant with Noah. He, he eventually makes the covenant, the, the primary covenant of which Scripture speaks, and that's the covenant with a man named Abram, who later becomes Abraham. God extends the hand of covenantal faith to Abraham. He extends it. He says, I'll make you a deal, Abraham. You will be my people, and I will be your God. I will give you descendants. I will give the Messiah through your lineage. I will give you the land if you will but trust me and believe my promises. And that's why the Bible says, man, Abraham thought that's a pretty good deal. He believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He said, man, I'm just going to believe God. And i got to say something right here. The essence of the gospel and the essence of the covenant was not the promises that Abraham made to God. It was the promises that God made to Abraham. Do you hear the difference there? So now let's, make that, let's bring that down to modern times, 2013 and beyond. The essence of the good news, the essence of the gospel is not the promises that you make to God. It's you believing the promises that God has made to you. Do you hear me, yes or no? And I, I want to say that to our listening audience as well. It's not about the promises that, that you make to God. Those promises are weak. Those promises fall apart. You know that. How many of us have made New Year's resolutions and failed to keep them, right? Your promises are like ropes of sand, as one author has said. But the real essence of the gospel is that God has made promises to you. And your responsibility, my responsibility, is to believe the promises of God. And Abraham did. And that's why the, the rest of Scripture takes up that covenant as the covenant, Okay, but what ends up happening is the descendants of Abraham, Israel, are consistently unfaithful, 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 rebellious, rebellious, rebellious to God's covenant. So an interesting thing happens. God extends his hand not only as God, but he pulls a bit of a flanking maneuver, and this is just where this is where the plot twist of scripture is just amazing. We've just mentioned this before. But God becomes a man and comes over on this side of the equation, becomes fully, completely a man, and he extends his hand to God in covenant faithfulness as a man. So a remarkable thing happens. God as God is extending his hand in covenant faithfulness, and God as man is extending his hand back to God in covenant faithfulness because no other man ever did it. No other man was faithful, and God's like, man, the only way this is ever going to work is if I become a man and I will keep my own covenant. It's absolutely beautiful. And so, by the way, the Bible calls this the covenant of peace. The, the Father extends his hand, the Son extends his hand, the Spirit imbues the covenant, and, and our job, now that the family of God has been reunited, is to believe that, to believe in the faithfulness of the Messiah. And I know that might sound a little unusual to some of you because so often we're thinking that the real issue is my faith in Jesus. I'm saved by my faith in Jesus. Well, there is an element of that that's true. But the far greater truth is that you are saved by the Messiah's faithfulness. Do you hear the difference? And when we talk about the Messiah's faithfulness, it was his faithfulness to the covenant. We've already talked about that. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Did Jesus do that? And the second was like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Did Jesus do that? Okay, so Jesus never violated the principles of the covenant. He never violated the law. And so there was no sin in him. There was no rebellion in him. There was no disloyalty in him. Jesus kept covenant with God. Yeah? And you believe it. You believe in the Messiah's faithfulness. And that's how you're grafted back into the family of God. Now, here's an interesting thing. 
When Jesus comes, his name is Yeshua, because he will save his people from his sins. But also in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, 22 and 23, it says you will call his name, now watch this, Emmanuel, which is translated, what is it? Translated God with us. There's the withness. The withness is back. That withness that had been when God had made Adam and he came close to him, he came with him, he came near to him, breathed into his nostrils. The withness is there, but through sin, selfishness, and, and self preservation, that withness was lost. So when God re extends his hand in covenant faithfulness, when God sends out his hand, he sends a Messiah and he says, You know what the Messiah's name will be? God, say it with me again, God with us. Now check this out. The whole Bible climaxes in, in this language, Revelation 21. Listen to the language here that John... Uh, it's rapturous, poetic, beautiful, incomparably awesome language. Revelation chapter 21. And uh, we'll pick it up here in verse... Uh, let's see, verse... Um, is it my, do I want verse 5? Verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying... Revelation 21 verse 3... Listen to this, John, this is the end of the whole thing. This is the, it's the end of the story. It's, it's the climax. It's the consummation. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. The whole Bible revolves around this basic theme, this basic idea that God longs to be with his creation. Can you say amen to that? I, I, to me, that, that is the most beautiful and grand thing. And it's right here at this point that I want to introduce you to this wild idea, this radical idea, that God actually relates to us in very filial language. Now you say filial language, what does that mean? Let me show you. By the way, prettiest girl in the room just walked out right there. <laughs> um, take a look at this. Go with me to the book of Exodus. We're going to look at three verses here. Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. Now this is speaking of Moses' communication with God on the mountain. Second, or excuse me, we're going to go to 2 Chronicles in just a moment. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 11. Look at this. Exodus 33, 11. It says, so the Lord spoke to Moses, how? Face to face. Hey, that was the very point we just made about Adam, right? That when God breathed into Adam's nostrils, whew, the breath of life, and he became a living soul, they were face to face. So notice what it says. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his what? To his friend. What a wild thing for God to say. Now, we've already made this point earlier in our seminar, but I'm just going to make it again here. Nobody knows what a God is. We have, we, we have no idea what we're talking about when we talk about a God. Right? We use our sort of philosophical, theological language. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. He's omniscient, all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He, that is to say he transcends time and space. He's eternal. He had no beginning or end. He's spirit. That is to say he's immaterial. But nobody in this room knows what we're talking about. We don't even have any kind of a mental picture. In fact, we actually had a slide we were going to be using. It was a mental picture. Uh, it, was, it was a slide in which God was giving the Ten Commandments to Moses. But I said, no, take that slide out. The reason we took it out was... The picture that they have of God is so human. It's so anthropomorphic. We, we don't know what we're talking about. We don't know what we're talking about. And yet here, Scripture has the temerity. It has the boldness. It has the, the grandeur and beauty to say that Moses spoke to God as a man speaks to his what? To his friend? Now, this same language is used just a little bit later. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and here I wish we had time to go into the backstory, which we don't. But Jehoshaphat is facing a large and pers uh, uh, encroaching army. Uh, and uh, as he's sort of facing this large and encroaching army, he calls out to God and he begins to pray to God. This is the guy you might remember that sent the choir out before the military. Okay, well anyway, as he's praying to God, he kind of holds God a little bit accountable here. He, he, he sort of says, hey God, let me remind you of who you are. And he starts like reminding God, hey, you're God, remember this, and, and you need to do this because you're God and we're not, and we're basically helpless here before this encroaching uh, army. So check it out in verse... Uh, 7 of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, he says, actually we'll pick it up in verse 5, then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem 
in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? He's basically saying, you're God, right? Because we're in trouble and we need your help. Now look at verse 7. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? What a marvelous thing. And the, the cool thing is, is that Jehoshaphat doesn't say this as a theological point. He's just speaking to God. He's just opening his heart in this vulnerable, transparent, difficult, stress-filled moment. And the thing that just sort of blah, 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 rolls off of his tongue is, I, I, you're God, and, and, and aren't you the one that can just move your hand in the nations? And, and, and you're God, remember? You're the one. I mean, you're the one that gave this to Abraham, your friend. You see, it's just so, it's so naturally a part of the Abrahamic story. I mean, Moses was the friend of God. Abraham was the friend of God. And Jesus himself in the New Testament, check this out, is speaking to his disciples, but he knew that the disciples would too easily fall into the contemporary picture of the rabbi-student relationship. And he knows that there is a sense in which the student-master and the student-teacher-pupil relationship, yeah, 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 that's there. There's no denying that that's there. We find Paul throughout the New Testament saying, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Paul, a servant of God. That element is there, but there's another element. That doesn't, that doesn't adequately, let me just say it this way. Our relationship with God is not less than servanthood, but it's more than that. It's not less than that, but it's more than that. And Jesus here, you, you almost get the sense of sort of uh, exasperation a little bit with the disciples not quite grasping it. And so he says to the disciples in John 15, 15, this is so easy to remember. Jesus says, no longer do I call you servants. Because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. And that makes sense, right? I, you're not just employees. I mean, the, the top CEO, COO, CFO of a company doesn't tell the, the lower echelons, the, you know, the bottom most people what's happening in the planning meetings. And so Jesus says, man, I can't really call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't really know what his master is up to. Watch this. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. What a fascinating thing to say. Jesus here sets the, the idea of you are my friend in juxtaposition with servanthood. He doesn't deny the reality that at some level God is God and we are his servants. God is God and, and we are to, to serve him in a subordinate role. But he says, I want there to be more of a mutuality. right? Not, not a hierarchical role where I'm over you, but a mutual role where we're, watch this language, with one another. Incidentally, when you come to the book of Revelation... God is so passionate about this mutuality. We would say it this way in, in modern business terms for those of you that work in the business world. We would say, and this will come off as a bit of, of a surprise to some of you, God prefers a flat management style. Right? God prefers a flat management style. How do we know that? Because the Bible says in the book of Revelation that the redeemed will sit with him on his throne. Right? They will be kings and priests with me on my throne. What is God thinking? Does he need help running the universe? No, he doesn't need help. He wants to be with us. Amen. And one of the great and grand overarching th themes of Scripture is that the very place where the separation was the greatest and the rebellion was the most obtuse and terrible and, and pathetic, that place where the break, where the breach was the worst will become the place where God is the closest. In fact, when John picks this up in Revelation, he says, man, they don't even need the sun because the lamb is with them. He's with, he's with, he's with. God is able to say the thing he always wanted to say throughout the entire Old and New Testaments. I will be your God and you will be my people. Amen. And God can say it. These are my people. Have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered my servant Mark? Have you considered my servant David? Have you considered my servant Tammy? These are, these are my people. Isn't this beautiful? Amen. So, in answer to the question, does God have time for me, the, 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 the better question is, do you have time for God? Yeah? Do you have time for God? One time I was praying on a Sabbath morning after a church service, and I found myself saying, Lord, you have spent time with us today, but have we spent time with you? And I realized it takes two. I mean, how many of us have had... Uh, conversations with our spouse or with our children or with somebody else where they are completely checked out, right? And they're just like, 
my wife will sometimes be, hello, hello, are we, oh yeah, I'm sorry, sweetheart, I was just daydreaming, which happens to me about, you know, every three seconds. That's why I have to talk this fast, because if, if I don't keep talking, then I'll just suddenly start thinking about something else, <laughs> right? That, that, and so, so, so God is longing to be with us. God is passionate about our presence. He wants us to be similarly passionate about his presence. Now, in, in no place in Scripture, in my personal opinion, no place in Scripture is this clearer than in God's commands, the first four commands, and particularly the fourth. Now, we've already sort of been over this. The first commandment is, you will have no other gods before me. God says, give me your affections. In the second commandment, God says, you will not bow down to any you know, graven images. Give me your body. Use your body in legitimate and appropriate, not illegitimate ways. Give me your body. The third commandment, you will not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. God says, give me your words. I want your words. I want your mouth. Give me those things. And here in the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God, this is a whole commandment built around time. I mean, what, what, what a wild thing to make holy if you really appreciate that. This is absolutely unique, by the way, in this sense. If God would have made the primary object of his sanctification or his, his holiness a place, say a holy temple, which there was a short period of that, but even the temple pointed to Jesus, Okay? If he would have a holy mountain, but even the mountain always pointed to proximity. If, if God just simply said, okay, there's a holy place and it's over there and you need to go visit and when you go there, then you can be in my presence. Well, the problem is, is that geographical realities prevent us from always being able to be at that place. Let's say the holy place is in Connecticut, right? Let's just say for purposes. Well, that might be really convenient for you guys because you can go to the holy place just fairly, you know, you'd be there in a few hours, right? But if, if somebody lives in, say, Swaziland and the holy place is in Connecticut, well, that's really inconvenient, right? And if somebody's in prison and the holy place is in Connecticut, now you are somehow separated from the holy place, the holy thing. So God, in a stroke of divine genius, says, ah, I'll make time holy. So you can be in Swaziland or in Connecticut or in Maryland or anywhere else all over the world. And here's the coolest thing, and this is a beautiful picture of the righteousness that comes by faith. You don't even have to go to the thing. The thing comes to you, right? You just like stand still and the earth is moving and in time it's going to do its thing and the sun is going to, you know, stay in its place and lo and behold, a week is going to, you know, seven of those cycles are going to come by and the Sabbath is going to find you. Where are you going to flee from the Sabbath? So in a stroke of brilliance, you can be in a prison cell and God says, I'll bring my holiness to you. I'll make time holy and bring it to you. You don't have to go traveling here and there to some place because then because of, of inconvenience or because of physical inability or because somebody won't let you go, you could be cut off from the holy thing. God understands that. And so he universalizes access to himself. I want you to hear that. He universalizes access to himself. He says, I'll give you a round planet so there's no like little corner where you can go hide and sort of stand there and be like, okay, I'm out of the orbit. No, no, the whole planet will get it, and it will come to you. So far, so good? Awesome. I mean, what a beautiful and grand picture. Why else create the Sabbath if not to spend time? Time with one another as a family unit, and time with God as the larger divine family unit. And this is exactly what we find in both the Old and the New Testaments, that God is absolutely passionate about spending time with his people. And we've already mentioned that affections, body, words, and time are the foundations upon which any relationship is built. Yes or no? Absolutely. Now, I think we've got here a picture. Let's see if it's going to come up. Excellent. The sanctuary, the, the, sanctu the, the tabernacle, go back one for I'll get Harrison Ford in a minute. Oh, we'll start with Harrison Ford. Might as well. Much younger Harrison Ford. When I was a, when I was a child, there was a movie that came out and the, the movie was Raiders of the Lost Ark. And uh, I didn't even know what that was about. But I later learned that the thing that, you know, this fictitious archaeologist adventurer was looking for was the ark. But well, what is an ark? Well, the ark was the ark of the covenant that was in the most holy place of the Israelite sanctuary. Of course, this is the Israelite sanctuary on the Sinai desert floor. It was later turned into Solomon's temple. After Solomon's temple was destroyed, uh, it was later turned into the second temple. But here's the point. This little, this little um, uh, picture here, this, this portrait of God's house, his, his blueprint, um, is made up of basically three compartments. You have the outer courtyard, which is just what it sounds like, and the outer court, sort of like, you can think of this as like the lawn, 
right? And you've even got a bit of a barbecue there, actually. That, that is what they used it for. Uh, I mean, they did. It's, uh, it's true. That's exactly what they did. They, they burned the stuff on there, and then the priest would eat some of it. And um, a friend of mine, Nathan Renner, whenever we go to some place and, you know, the... Uh, he's pastors in the Sonora Church. Whenever we go someplace and, you know, it really smells like McDonald's or Burger King or some steakhouse, you know, we'll ha- often have some, like, really pious vegetarians with us, and they're like, oh, I hate that smell. Oh, so gross. And uh, what my friend Nathan always says is, ah, the smell of the sanctuary. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And it's so true. It's so true. I mean, if you would have gone to the sanctuary, it would have smelled like a barbecue. That's, that's what it was. And I'm not saying that to demean it. I mean, that's, that's what it smelled like. They were continually burning animals on the altar. And so that was sort of the outer courtyard. But then you went into the house and you had the, the sort of holy place. And then you had the most holy place, which is just what it sounds like. It was the most holy place. But here's the coolest thing. The single article of furniture, and now you might be thinking, this whole house analogy, really? Really? Let me just sort of back that up a little bit here. Um, there There was food in the holy place. It was the table of showbread, and there were instruments. There were like, there was silverware there. There were utensils. There was a light, and there was even incense for ambiance. It was basically like a restaurant. It was a dining room. Now, you might be thinking, really? Yeah, really? Because in ancient times, unlike in modern times where we just eat, we just eat and we just, okay, I'm done eating. Now I'm gonna, I got my, my quick yogurt, my quick granola bar, and I'm done eating. No. In ancient times, when they didn't have all of the foolish things that distract us from what life is really about, a meal, and by the way, there are still places in the world where it's like this, a meal really means something. To sit down and to have a meal is a connection, and it's a covenantal connection. In fact, what does Jesus say in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come in and I'll eat with him. Right? That's a way in saying, that's a way of saying, I will have a close connection with him. What do we do at weddings? After the wedding is done, we get together and we have a what? We have a meal because the meal, the meal brings parties together. I mean, real fellowship and real communion happens around the table. Isn't this true? Now, if you're sitting there thinking, well, my home isn't like that, you have been sorely deprived of one of the great joys in life. Good food with good company and good conversation is literally much of what life is made of. By the way, there's a great story. I was just talking about Moses on top of Mount Sinai. There's an interesting story ensconced in that little passage. It says that when Moses went to the top of the mountain on one occasion, he brought 70 of the children, children of Israel up with him, and it says they saw the Lord. And then do you know what it says? And they ate and drank before him. They had a meal with God atop the restaurant and the, the restaurant atop Mount Sinai. So here, in a very fascinating sense, when you went into the most when you went into the holy place, excuse me, it it had food, it had utensils, it had lighting, and it had incense. In other words, it was a place for communion. It was a place for connection. And that doesn't in any way demean it or diminish it. It makes it beautiful. It makes it relational. It makes it real. Right? Jesus shared the last supper with his disciples. In fact, he was so passionate about it that he said to them, listen, fellas, I won't even, I won't even drink of this cup again until the time where I drink it with you fresh in the kingdom of heaven. You find this again and again. Jesus said, many will come from the east and the west and will sit down. And the implication is sit down to sup with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. On another occasion, I think it's Luke chapter 11, Jesus said, let me tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is going to be like when the master comes and he girds himself with a towel and he serves those who are eating. There's a lot of eating going on in these really profound covenantal connections in Scripture. And that's because it's a time of connection. It's a time of relationality. It's a time to really connect with another human being. So far, so good? Okay, so now you go into the most holy place. And the most holy place was basically barren except for a single article of furniture. And that article of furniture was the thing that Harrison Ford was ostensibly looking for. And that's the Ark of the Covenant, which is basically a box. And don't miss that. The the Ark of the Covenant wasn't really all that special in terms of the box. What made the Ark of the Covenant so special was its contents. Right? If you, go to a, if you go to a place and try to buy a pair of shoes and they say, oh, man, I need to get new shoes. And they say, oh, Pastor Ash or Pastor Ash or whatever, they say to you, um, yeah, we, 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 we don't have those shoes, but we got a nice box. <laughs> you say, you know what? Really? A box? I'll take two. No. No. 
you don't care about the box. What do you want? You, but if they came and they said, ah, we got some good news and some bad news. Oh, what is it? We have the shoe you want. Okay, good. Check. In the size you want. Check. In the color you want. Check, check, check. And they say, but we're missing the box. And you're like, Psh, no deal. <laughs> no, no deal. I need the box. I need to throw it away at my house. <laughs> right? No. You want, the, the, you want the, what's in the box, and that's what made the Ark of the Covenant so special. It wasn't the box. It what was, it's what was in there. And you know what was in there? God's Ten Commandments, his rules of relational integrity. Relational integrity before God, the first four commandments, and relational integrity before your, your neighbor, the second six. In fact, check this out. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 3. If you want to try to meet me there, Deuteronomy, see if you can beat me. You didn't. I'm there. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 3. <laughs> Even your computer Bibles aren't going that fast. I know it's not happening. You're like, uh, Deuteronomy 4, 3. I'm already there. Um, so he declared to you his covenant. That's his relationship. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Right? Beautiful. Th th this, this, this thing is called the Ark of the Covenant. Do yourself a favor and think of that thing as the ark of the relationship. That's what it was. It was the ark of the relationship. It was the ark that, that guarded the witness. And by the way, this is super cool. The only day that anyone went into that place, into that room, was on the 10th day of the 7th month, on the day of at one Atonement. And, and that's just, at one minute, is just another way of saying the day of the closest relationship. And I'm, I'm actually reading through a marvelous book right now that's a little scholarly, but if you're interested in this, you need to get your hands on a book called Cult and Character by Roy Gain. Cult and Character. And again, it's a little scholarly, but you can get, if, if, you, if you have any interest in this at all, you've got to read this book. It's absolutely remarkable. And basically what, what he does is he unpacks Leviticus chapter 16, the Day of Atonement, and, and just walks through this ritual, walks through this amazing ceremony of Leviticus 16 and the Day of Atonement, and how it's just intimacy, intimacy, proximity, proximity. It's close, it's close, it's close, it's close. It's the very thing God is after. It's the thing he's been after since he said uh, in, in Genesis 1 and 2, let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be. But when it came time to make a companion, when it came time to make a son, when it came time to make a friend, you come down, you form, you fashion with your hands. And, and more than any other single commandment, more than any other single commandment in, in the, the first four commandments is this idea of the Sabbath. Again, it's sort of the, the out-of-place commandment in the sense that it's a strange thing to command, right? Commanding to take time. Commanding for you to spend time with me in relationship. In a book, another excellent book. Now, this is one you should read, all of you. Every single person should read this book. It's called The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day. Write that down. The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day by Dr. Sigve Tonstad. T-O-N-S-T-A-D. Dr. Sigve Tonstad. And uh, in that book, there's a fascinating, it might be a chapter or a section in which Dr. Tonstad says that the Sabbath is what he calls, listen to this, the reluctant commandment. It's the reluctant commandment because it's, it's not really a commandment in the obligatory sense, in the duty sense. It's, an, it's a privilege. It's an opportunity. It's like saying, you will take a vacation. Like, okay, 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 twist my arm. Okay, we'll go. Where are we going? Right? That God longs to spend time with us. He, he, he commands us, but he commands us because he knows it's for our own best good. And if, if he just said, well, you know, you know, think about it and try to make time for it and do your best, most of us, most of us wouldn't do it because we'd be so busy working ourselves to death or spending time doing other things. And so it has to be a commandment because of the obligatory nature, but the essence of the thing is relational and you can't command a relationship. Do you hear that, everyone? It's the reluctant commandment. Jesus said it this way. He said, man, when I made the Sabbath, I made the Sabbath for man, for his benefit. He didn't, notice this, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. It's not as though, you know, he, he made the Sabbath and he's like, oh, well, who's going to keep this thing? I will guess I'll make a man to do it and make a man to keep the day. No, the, the significance is in the man, right? The significance is in the man. The man is the significance. And he says this, ah, I made this for you. The Sabbath was not made for, 
the Sabbath, excuse me, was made for men and not man for the Sabbath. What God is saying here is, I was thinking of you when I made this. You need this. And I'm going to even go out on a limb here. And I'm not making a philosophical statement. I'm making a, a relational statement. You need the Sabbath, but so does God. God needs to be, not in terms of his ontological perfection, for those of you that are persnickety about words, but he needs to spend time with you relationally. God made you for that purpose. You were made to be with him. In fact, the opening sentence, I think it's the opening sentence in the Westminster Catechism. I could be wrong about that. It might be the second or third or whatever. But there's this really great section in the Westminster Catechism where it asks, you know, in classic catechistic form, it says, you know, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. This is one of the great confessions of the Christian faith. It says, what is the chief end of man? Answer. The chief end of man is to know God and to enjoy him forever. Boom! Got that one right. The chief end of man is to know God and to enjoy him forever. The beauty of the Sabbath, this, this seventh day, is that it encapsulates everything that we've been talking to up to this point. It encapsulates the relational element, the intimacy element, the time element. All of that is wrapped in this holy thing. Again, not a holy place like Connecticut, but, but a holy space in time. Someone has rightfully called it a temple in time. The late Dr. Sam Bakayoki wrote this in his book, Divine Rest for Human Restlessness. The Sabbath rest teaches the greedy heart to be what? To be grateful. To stop for one day looking for more and start instead gratefully to acknowledge the blessings already received. That's really the beauty of the Sabbath, and that's where the don't work thing comes in. The don't work thing comes in and it's like, oh, whoa, 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 slow down. The abundance of a, of a man's life does not consist, or the, the, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. You've got plenty of stuff, right? I don't know about you, but I've got plenty of stuff. I always think when I go to the mall, ooh, ooh, look, it's on sale. I need me one of those. I'll get two just in case. Before you know it, you've got a bunch of stuff. My wife and I and our family right now are looking possibly at making an overseas move, and we're praying about it. It's a good opportunity, and we just want to go where the Lord wants us to go. But one of the things that's really attractive to me about this opportunity, frankly, is that um, we would just get rid of everything. Man, how awesome would that be? I keep, my wife's like, I'm not so convinced. I'm like, no, sweetie, it'd be awesome. Everything you own is in two suitcases. Everything I own is in two suitcases. Let's just liquidate it. She's like, ah, oh, but we got a lot of good stuff. I'm like, but let's get rid of it. Right? And you got to tell me, there is something for some of you that it's a little edgy, it's a little scary, I get that, but isn't there a, wouldn't there be a freedom in knowing that everything you own is in that suitcase? Isn't that awesome? Because all this stuff is going to burn up anyway, right? We're just giving it a bit of a head start. We'll Craigslist it and get rid of it, and you know what I mean? I mean, there's something really attractive about that. Several years ago, a good friend of mine, Audrey, her house burned down, and I was like, you know, I was like, whoa, you must have been devastated. She's like, true story. She said it was the best thing that ever happened to us. <laughs> now, just let that sink in. To be able to say, all your stuff has been gone. It's, it's in smoke. It's ashes. And to be able to say, in hindsight, this wasn't like 10 years later. This was like eight months later. She's like, best thing that ever happened. Right? Because we accumulate stuff, and I need more, and I need this and that. And 25 pairs of shoes is not enough. I need 26 or whatever it is. And um, what, what the Sabbath does is the Sabbath says, stop. Just be content. Be content with what you have rather than making this day like the other six days where it's about accumulation and more. And just, isn't that awesome? It's a beautiful thing. Look at this. I love this. This is from Dr. Tonstad's book. In the Sabbath, God comes to all observing men and women, whatever their rank, no Jew has to think that he is ultimately in God's eyes inferior to any other man. I think this is actually Norman Gully. Observance of this, or Kenneth Strand, excuse me. Observance of the Sabbath frees the Jew from all hierarchies. On the Sabbath, servant and master meet as equals. Fascinating. As free human personalities, Sabbath is thus a weekly recurring divine protest against slavery and oppression. Lifting up his Kiddush cup on Friday night, the Jew links the creation of the world, that's what we talked about there, the creation of his nostrils, with man's freedom, so declaring slavery and oppression deadly sins against the very foundation of the universe. Kenneth Strand. Can you say amen to that? I love that. Slavery and oppression are deadly sins against the very foundation of the universe. And we talked about that when we talked about La Amistad. 
right? That there's something wrong about men controlling other men and other people. And God didn't make us to, to control or be controlled. He made us to create, to communicate, and to connect primarily with Him, but also with those around us. I love this. What, what, what Strand is saying here is that the Sabbath is the great equalizer, servant. In fact, the command says that. The command actually lists, in fact, look at this quotation. This is the one I thought was the earlier one. This is Dr. Tonstad from the book that I just recommended, which you're going to order. As soon as the Sabbath's done, you're going to go home on Amazon.com, Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day, you're going to order it. By the way, I have no financial connection at all. You just need that book in your library. The seventh day must be seen as the launching pad for the most exceptional and ambitious project of social justice in the ancient world. Their freedom from work and from the yoke of exploitation are explicit characteristics of the Sabbath. When the circle is drawn, nothing and nobody lie outside its domain. The particulars on this list are amazing because no parallels have been found in other cultures. Legislation of this kind in the ancient world prioritizes from the bottom up, not from the top looking down, giving first consideration to the weakest and most vulnerable members of society. Your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor the stranger that is within your gates, even your cows. Those who need rest the most, the slave, the resident alien, and the beast of burden are singled out for special mention. In the rest of the seventh day, the underprivileged, even mute animals find an ally. Dr. Tan said, this is brilliant. Basically, this is the new heaven and the new earth every week. Did you get that? It's the new heaven and the new earth every week. There are no governments. There are no hierarchies. There are no slaves. There are no masters. Everyone meets as equals. Everyone resting. Everyone content. Everyone in fellowship with one another and particularly in fellowship with God. No wonder the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that even after all of this is said and done, when sin and suffering are no more and pain is but a faint memory, it says that from one new moon and from one Sabbath to another... We will come and worship before God because it is a foretaste, a a taste of what God has always wanted and continues to want. And that is that withness. He longs to be with us and no command, no command is, is clearer on that than the Sabbath command itself. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, God says. Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man. I get such a kick out of it when people say, oh, I don't keep the Sabbath, I'm not a legalist. What? What could you possibly mean by that? That's like saying, I don't honor my anniversary. I'm not a legalist. I don't remember my birthday either, and I don't go on vacation. I'm not a legalist. I don't want it. What? What are you talking about? The beauty and the guts and and the, the fiber and fabric of the Sabbath is not primarily in its obligation, though that is there. It's in the opportunity to fellowship with one another in equality and with God. If you're a Sabbath keeper already, I invite you to take a new view of the Sabbath, a higher view of the Sabbath as a relational opportunity to engage with God and with one another. Sure, you, God has been with you all day, right? He's, he's always there. But have you been with Him? And if you're, if you're not a Sabbath keeper, and I want to speak to our viewing audience here as well, if you're like, whoa, you're just hearing some of this for the first time, I, I want to strongly encourage those of you that are here and those that are tuning in, take a look at this commandment. It's the reluctant commandment. It's the time commandment. It's the commandment in which God says, I not only love you, I like you. And I want to spend time with you. I have time for you. Do you have time for me?